on it too. How many people in here have ever gotten frustrated with their printer? Right? Right? So I think there's a movie where they actually beat the printer to death. That looks very satisfying. But, but the truth is, for all of us, we get frustrated about things, you ready, that people didn't even have. By the way, I think the Tesla thing, I think you're being punked. I honestly don't think he's charging. I think it's like the Twitter thing where the guy stood out front with the box and the, the book and said, oh, we worked here, and it was a joke. So be careful what you believe when it comes to the news and even people locally being funny. So anyway, it'll probably be on Facebook later today, and then you'll go, oh. Anyway, um, So, you know, gratitude is an interesting thing because here's the deal. We have so much. Do you realize how much we have? I was telling somebody, even the Amish who said years ago, we will never use vehicles. Did you know they're allowed to use battery powered things and phones? And if you order one of their stoves, guess how it gets to you? Back of a truck. There's not a buggy bringing it to your house. And so we have so much, and we say, well, technology just keeps moving. I don't want that, but aren't you glad you're not washing clothes by hand? And yet, when your washing machine breaks, you lose your mind, right? So these are jumper cables, which is ironic. Maybe I should, anyway. So, but, but here's the thing. If your car battery won't start your engine, your engine won't go anywhere. And here's the thing about life for us. When you're going through, whether it's a hard time or a good time, when you find that your gratitude filter, your your gratitude gas tank, your gratitude battery level, when you find that it's low, you need to take some time to let God jumpstart you. Because here's the deal. We all struggle with grumpiness. All of us. I mean, you've had it where you slept fine, you woke up in the morning, and for whatever reason, I don't know if it's something you ate, some dream you had, whatever, and you just wake up and you don't feel grateful. You feel aggravated. And some of you are thinking, my spouse wakes up that way every day, right? And, and here's the thing. What gratitude does is it recharges us in order to make us very aware of all of our blessings, to make us very aware in the moment of all the things. And here's the deal. You can do that no matter what your circumstance right now. When you look in scripture, you see people in jail singing songs of praise. They were just beaten. And we're like, oh, I slept funny last night. I mean, you know, we complain about all kinds of things. And the truth is you can complain about anything or you can recognize what you've been given. And so no matter what's going on in your life, whether right now you're in a great time, this is the best time of my life. By the way, hardly anybody ever says that, even when it's the best time of their life. Or if you're going through a trial, a struggle, a difficulty, a pain, you're waiting for some information back, you're in this waiting time, you're worried about the next thing, hey, take time to be grateful right now. Right where you're at. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to renew your gratitude. And today we're going to talk about this idea of controlling and obedience. We're going to talk about how Christ protects us. And then we're going to reflect on our blessings. Because we tend to be, we just take things for granted, right? We just, we just get to where we're focused on. The, let me, okay, I want to give you one more example to help you out. Okay, how many of you like to shop at Publix? Like it's a pleasure, right? Okay, how many of you love Walmart? Walmart's your favorite? Okay, so you don't like Publix, you don't like Walmart. Where are you people shopping? How many of you love Aldi? Aldi's your favorite. Okay, so so you ever get in line, and as you're going to the line, you count how many are there, and you think who's there, and you, and you go for the shortest line, and so if you're like me, you're in Publix, and you get in the shortest line, and then you, you get to the front, and you're looking to see who, if you're going to beat the person next to you. If you don't do this, you do this in traffic, because you're like, oh, that guy, I'm going to get past that, right? So, so you're doing this in line, and then what happens? The coupon lady with the book. She's got a book from 1962 with all the... And she starts... All of a sudden, you see the book come out, and you're like, oh, no, right? Now, realize, you have just gone through the miracle of shopping in America, whether it's Aldi or Publix or even Walmart people. When people from other countries come here and just see the amount of things we have, they're just blown away. And yet, what do we focus on? Oh, this is taking me a whole seven minutes to get out of here. 
Do you see how gratitude and, and perspective impact us? So we're going to look at, in the Old Testament, this idea of Passover. And I'm going to give you three things to maybe help you and give you a, maybe a new look at this. So here it is. Number one, release your control and obey. By the way, one of the main reasons that we're unhappy so often has nothing to do with what's going on. It has to do with us wanting to control what's going on. What, do you realize that people thought 30 was too fast 100 years ago? They said, those new cars, they're just crazy. They go over 30. Have you been on 95 lately? I, I'm starting to wonder what fast enough is. Because whatever speed I'm going is the perfect speed. Whatever speed is slowing me down, that's an idiot. And whatever speed the person passes me out, that's a moron. Right? So we tend to think that way. All right, so here we go. Because why? Because I should be in control, right? Okay, so this is the day, uh, uh, Moses is telling the people, this is a day to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. We're talking about Passover, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you're to eat bread made without yeast. Now, I'm going to come back to that, so just hold on to that thought. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day must be caught off from Israel. Wish I had time to talk about that today. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly. What's a sacred assembly? It's an assembly where you say, is there any sin in our lives? Is there anything where we're not agreeing with God? And then it continues. And another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may, need, all you may do. Now couple things going on here. First of all, they are being told what to do on the Passover while they're still in Egypt. They have not yet seen a miracle. The angel has not come yet. The freedom has not come yet. They're still in bondage. But here's what God is saying. You obey me and then you'll see me move. And so one of the things they were supposed to do was get all the yeast. By the way, they still do this. I talked to some former missionaries from Israel. Oh, excuse me, Christian workers from Israel. And last night they were telling me how during this time they go through, they sweep every corner of the house. They get rid of all yeast, anything, any bread that's... By the way, how many of you would rather have matzah rather than nice fluffy bread? Anybody in here that's my... No, right, right? Nobody says, oh, I wish I had unleavened bread. No, that's not the point. And so get rid of all yeast. And he, they said they actually go and they wash all their pots outside and everything to make sure that all the yeast is out of the house. Why? Because yeast in scripture represents sin. It represents those times where we say to God, my way is better than your way. And so he said, before I do this great miracle, I want you to get rid of anything that's strangling your life. In Miami, we used to... Uh, have these uh, down uh, where it doesn't freeze. We had something called a strangler fig. And I don't know if you've ever seen these. I remember, I always thought strangler figs were really cool, which is weird. But I did because what would happen is you would have a big palm tree and a bird would come and deposit a seed of a strangler fig in that tree. And what would happen? The roots would grow out of that top of that palm palm tree and start to grow down the tree. And as it did, it would wrap around the tree all the way to the ground. And eventually what would happen is that strangler fig would kill the tree and it was so cool looking because the tree would die and the strangler fig had this hollow core, this hollow center where it had destroyed the tree and now the strangler fig took its place. It's exactly what sin does to us. We think it's not going to be a big deal. We'll allow this thought in my life. We'll allow this attitude in my life. We'll pursue this habit, even though we know God doesn't want us to do it. And as we pursue those things, what happens? It slowly strangles the life out of us. So early on in scripture, when it talks about obedience, he says, hey, have a solemn assembly. Take time to see, is there any area of my life, God, where I'm not agreeing with you? The yeast, getting rid of the yeast, was an example, an outward sign of what they were supposed to do in their hearts. Now, if you think worship only happened after Abraham and sacrifice only happened after God told them to, listen to what Noah says. So Noah came out together with his sons, his wife, and his son's wife. So realize they've been in this boat like a year with stinky animals, right? All the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah, listen to what he did, built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. 
Have you ever been on a rough airplane ride? Anybody in here ever been on a rough airplane ride? Isn't it amazing when you land how much you appreciate the earth? We had somebody in our church who recently went on a wonderful cruise. And while they were on their cruise, a hurricane visited us here in Florida. By the way, your pastor went out of town, but that's another story for another day. We didn't know it was coming. So left my poor mother alone. Anyway, so okay. So, so it was the guilt. The guilt vacation is what I had. So anyway, but this, this couple went on a cruise, and they were on their cruise and out on their cruise, and because the water was so rough, they couldn't go into port. So they went around and around the Bahamas. Was it the Bahamas? Went around and around the Bahamas, day after day, round and round she goes. Where they stop? Nope. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Were you glad to get back on land? Was it nice to get somewhere where you could actually go somewhere and do something and it was still? Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten seasick, but you appreciate land. So here's the thing. It is amazing how when we go through a hard time, we tend to appreciate what we've been given. Noah gets out of the ark and says, God, thank you so much. Now, was everything going great? No. Was Noah a perfect person? No, 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 no. You read the story of Noah and you're like, he did what? You read the story of Abraham, you're like, he did what? You read the story of David, you're like, we're singing his songs still? That dude's messed up, right? So many of our songs come out of the Psalms still. Broken, messed up people. Hey, but what happened? They had a heart after God. Why? Because they said, regardless of what's going on, God, I take time to worship you. Listen, if you really want to change your attitude, dedicate every area of your life to Christ. See, one of the reasons sometimes that we're having such a hard time is we want to say we're following God, and then we want to do whatever we want. We want to tell God, God, I want you to bless my life. God, I want you to do what I want you to do. And then when God says, yes, but I want you to obey me, we go, oh, no, I don't want to do that. Number two, remember that Christ protects you. Do you remember Gallagher? I think he's still alive, so I shouldn't say remember Gallagher. But anyway, so, but, but if you were alive in the early 80s, Gallagher was this comedian, and he would get watermelons, and he would put giant watermelons on the front of the stage, and then he would take this giant sledgehammer and smash the watermelons. And for some reason, we thought that was awesome. And if you were in the audience, you typically brought plastic or something like that, right? Why? To keep the watermelon off of you. Now, let me contrast that, that to Shamu. If you'd never been to Shamu, you would go and see Shamu, and they would have a splash zone marked. And if you were smart, you sat behind the splash zone like I did many times, and you would watch the people in front of you. And there was always somebody in front of you that didn't realize they were sitting in a splash zone. They came in late, whatever. And at some point, Shamu would jump, and water would go everywhere, and here's what they would do. Oh, no. Now, so now, not only were they wet, but the palms of their hands were everything was wet. Now, if they had a poncho on, they were protected. But if they didn't, guess what? It didn't matter how good they thought they were. They were not protected. Here's the thing. When you, in your own power, try to protect yourself and you don't trust in the blood of Jesus, you don't trust in what Jesus did for you, when you try to earn your way to heaven, when you try to work your way to God, when you try to say, my good will outweigh my bad, it's just like raising up your hands and wondering why you're wet. Listen to what happens next. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and he said to them, go at once, select animals for your family and slaughter the Passover lamb. By the way, the Passover lamb represents Jesus. I don't have time to go into that too much, but just know that. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put it on the blood on the tops and both sides of the doorframe. None of you will go out the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he'll see the blood on the top and side of the doorframes and will pass over the doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So this awful thing is getting ready to happen. The whole point of it is for the Israelites to be freed from Egypt. And yet, there was nothing they could do. It wasn't just like getting their act together. It was the blood of the Passover lamb. What was it? It was a representation of, God, I need forgiveness. God, I can't earn my way. Even Old Testament, they weren't earning their way to salvation. They understood, I can't do anything to earn it. But I trust in Jesus. I put the poncho of Jesus on, right? 
Listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 12, if you don't realize the combination here. It says in heaven, this is going to happen. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So what does that look like in your life? Did you know that there are scriptures in the Bible where Jesus said, when you go to a house, pray peace over that house. And then what's even awesomer, that's not a word, but you go with it. Jesus said, if basically, if they don't treat you well, take your peace with you and get the dust off your feet, which is awesome. Jesus is like, you can pray for peace. And then if they don't treat you right, take your peace with you. Let them be miserable. I think that's awesome. Now, here's what's really cool about that. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that you can actually go places and ask God to bring his peace there. And so every Sunday when I come here, you don't know this, but as I walk in the parking lot, I park way down there, and people are always like, why are you parking down here? But I always walk through, and I say, God, would you help people to experience your peace and your presence as they come to church, as they show up on this place? Because of that scripture. And you ought to be doing the same thing at your house. You know, people every once in a while call me. They say, will you come anoint our house and pray over our house? So I'll go. I'll take olive oil or whatever kind of oil I have. And I'll go to the house and I'll anoint the doors with oil. It's not me doing that. It's just a representation. God, just like blood over the doors in Egypt was a sign of your presence. God, I pray for your protection. By the way, it's amazing how many people suddenly get a prayer life when they have teenagers. <laughs> right? Because they're like, I don't know what happened. It's like Satan entered my house. I better start praying more. Right? And so I encourage you in your own house. Listen, you don't have to wait for the pastor. It's not my hands that are doing it. It's the anointing of Jesus. So you say, Jesus, would you pray and go? Listen, you can pray over the doorways. It, it's not. It's just symbolic. Just like this was symbolic. It was a sign of Jesus' protection, of God's protection for people. It wasn't the actual blood that was protecting the people. It was what the blood represented, which was we are trusting God for our protection. So when you pray over your house, when you pray over your family, when you pray over your friends, when you visit your friend's house and you say, Lord, would you bring your peace here? What is it? You're representing God. You can do that. I can't do it. I'm Shamu with water. Oh, I wrote two things on my hand. I saw you look at it. Next Saturday morning at 8 a.m., we will be picking up trash from 8 to 9 down this road. Also, Operation Christmas Child today, after service, we'll be packing boxes. How did I do? Six letters on my hand did that. Okay. So here's the thing. You can't protect yourself from Shamu, and you can't protect yourself from spiritual attacks. And so many people, especially this time of year, we were near Salem just a few weeks ago, and people are so excited to see satanic stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's the opposite of where I want to be. You know, I always think a Christian dressing like a witch is like a dolphin fan just dressing like a Jets fan. It's just you just don't, shouldn't do it. But anyway, that's another story for another day. But, but here's the deal. Everybody's so excited about that, and yet Christians sometimes, we're more focused on the demonic than we are on the protection that God provides. And just like you can't protect yourself from Shamu, yes, you're aware that water's coming. But you're not trusting in yourself. You're wearing the poncho of praise. Oh, I like that. Right? You're saying, Jesus, I need you. And you allow him to protect you. And then you're grateful. So focus on his protection, not the danger. That's your next point that's in the notes. Focus on his protection, not the danger. Too often, we're focused on Satan and demons and their attacks, and those things are real, but that shouldn't be your focus, even any more than the water from Shamu. God, I, I've got your protection, and I'm focusing on that, so even when the waves come, I'm protected by your blood. Charles Dickens said this, an imperfect man, another imperfect person, reflect upon your present blessings of which every man has many, not on your past misfortunes of which all men have some. Charles Dickens had a terrible childhood. That was back in the days when your parents couldn't pay your debt, they put the kids to work. Did you know that? And so he actually had to work in a, in a shop making ink. Terrible childhood. He could hear the rats running up and down the stairs. If you read uh, 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 the Christmas Carol, he describes the chains like rats running up and down the stairs. He thought of when he was a child. We all have memories that aren't pleasant, but we focus instead on the gratitude that we have. Number three. So we release control and obey. We remember Christ's fiction. Number three. Reflect on your blessings. Years ago, they sent 
uh, uh, British missionaries to Africa, to deep jungles of Africa. And a year later, they would go and check on these missionaries, and the missionaries over and over again went crazy. It was too much of a shift for them. They, they went from living in England to living in a totally different setting, and it freaked them out, and they basically became crazy people. And so the missionary society met and said, what should we do? And they said, I know what we'll do. We want you every day, and I think it's 3 or 4 p.m. If you're British, you can correct me. They said, every day, you're going to bring a tea set with you. And every day, you're going to have high tea. I think it's 4 o'clock. You're going to have high tea together every day. And what they found is when they went back, guess what? Those people were saying, why? Because they went back to their roots of what they were about, and every day they were reminded, we have high tea together. We have this organized system. Listen, I want to encourage you more than high tea that every day you have high gratitude. Every day when you get up in the morning, you think of some things you're thankful for and grateful for. If you want that grumpiness, that wrong attitude, that some of you struggle with anxiety. If you want to deal with that in a better way, I'm not saying it won't exist at all. Hey, time for a gratitude tea. God, thank you for what you've given me. God, thank you for what I have. God, you've always taken care of me. I know you will take care of me again. In Exodus 12, 24, it continues, Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land, the Lord will give you as he promised. Observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people down, down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And listen, nothing had changed. They were not out of Egypt yet. This miracle had not happened yet. God had not come through yet, but they were praising him ahead of time. God, we're going to trust you. You're going to take care of us. Some of you, regardless of what you're going through, maybe you haven't seen God move and you feel like, how am I going to walk through this? Maybe your first step needs to be, God, I'm going to trust you. And one of my favorite prayers is, God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. In Ephesians 5, 19, it says, Sing and make music from your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Make daily time to count your blessings. Now, I'm going to tell you a story from 30 years ago. Now, I don't know if, if, if you have ever seen Wonderful Life. And if you haven't, it's okay. But in Wonderful Life, basically, George Bailey gets to the point where he starts yelling about everything. Nothing. You know, why do we have to have all these kids? Why do we have this old drafty house? Why do we have all this? He, as he's walking by his staircase, the, the top on his staircase is loose. And he gets mad about it and acts like he's going to throw it. And then he just puts it, slams it back. And he goes off and he's all depressed and discouraged. Well, at the end of the movie, exactly the opposite happens. And he walks in and he realizes how blessed he is. And as he goes to run up the stairs, he grabs that thing and it comes off. And instead of wanting to throw it, he kisses it and puts it back on the stair. So years ago, 30 years ago, when I was a teacher, I visited my principal's house, Mr. Ferguson. And when I visited his house, I walked by his staircase and he had one of those things on top. And I said, oh, this is like wonderful life. And I pulled it right off. Of course, I thought I broke it. He said, it's that way on purpose. I said, well, you know, you could put a little glue. He goes, I know. He said, I left it that way so it'll remind me to appreciate all that I've been given. We all need a reminder in life. I don't care if you need a post-it note that says, be thankful. I don't care if you need to write, maybe you need to get a tattoo, right? I don't care, maybe not. But, but I don't care what you do, but find a way to remind yourself to take times every, every day to be thankful. If you do that, it's going to change you. It's easy in our world of grumpiness and critical spirit and when the, the people are trying to trick us with all kind of things to get focused on, am I being tricked? Am I being whatever? Or you can focus on, look at all God's given me. Look at how blessed I am. Look at all that he's done in my life. Look how he's blessing my family. Look how he's doing this or that. Gratitude. Next four weeks, we're going to talk about gratitude and being grateful. I hope that every week I give you another way you can just look for a practical way 
just to give thanks. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service, and you can say, I believe Jesus died and rose again. I want to surrender my life to him. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service, and you can do that. If you're here today and the truth is you've allowed things in your life and you noticed this morning anxiety was more your focus than praise, hey, it happens to all of us, even your pastor. So take time just to be thankful. Take time to be grateful. Commit all areas of your life to him. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. We're so grateful for all you've given us. Lord, we thank you that Jesus pays for our sin. It's not because of our works. It's not because of anything we do, but because when we surrender our lives to him, he covers us. We are grateful. Father, I pray for that one today who doesn't know you. Lord, that today they would surrender their life to you. Lord, I also know we all struggle with ingratitude sometime. We've been given so much. Lord, help us to be grateful, to be thankful. Lord, we surrender all those times to you. In Jesus' name, amen.